Um, I was kind enough to give Trevor now 18 minutes <laughs> forewarning that I was going to put him on the spot. Um, for those of you that haven't noticed, it is our pleasure to have in service with us today Trevor and Brittany Essays. Um, they're, they're our family that has moved away and they're coming back to visit with us. And I'm, I'm just going to turn this over to Trevor and let him come up and just share with us what's been going on with the SI. So, here you go. Yay. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you to do the meeting. <laughs> I might as well preach too. <laughs> um, I still need my security blanket. Oh. So, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. It's good to see a lot of you. And there's a lot of you here that I don't know, which is a good thing, I guess, because that means people have come in a year and a half I've been gone. So, uh, yeah, it's been a year and a half. It's uh, been it's been awesome and struggling and all of the above um, for the last year and a half. Uh, you know, we, we got over to to Washington and uh, you know just starting over. You know, going from here to to a part time youth pastor position and and um, it was very difficult at first. Um, just to, to kind of just get the hang of it. And, and the, you know, the first six months was probably the hardest six months of, of um, that I've dealt with in a very long time. Um, and, and that's just me finding my place in, in a new place and in a new church with a bunch of new people and um, being around my family, which I love, but I've been away for 13 years, so it was nice. Um, but, you know, you're, you're just getting back into to that, the, the swing of things there and finding your new place and, and finding um, who we are. But, like I said, it was, you know, it took a while to, to build those relationships, you know, with, with the kids at youth group. And, um, you know, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, I expected to walk in there and just blow the doors off and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, it was a massive, uh, guys, that I'm going to show you your pride, my friend. Yeah. Um, and, and he did. And it was a very awesome, you know, I guess, recovery for me to, to really just say, you know, God, I'm going to do with what you give me. And, um, you know, and so, so yeah, so, so right now, you know, youth group is going well. I know you guys are leaving for Belize in, in the middle of June, and we're leaving for an orphanage in Mexico at basically the exact same time. We'll be over there, um, down at our orphanage down there, and, um, which is just awesome. And so, you know, we're just, we're, we're, it's, it's been a year and a half, which just blows my mind already. Um, and the, the kids are great. They, they're, they're loving their school, and, um, Brittany's the, the PTO president already, so you can refer to her as Madam President. Um, that's great. And uh, so, no, and we just we moved two days before we drove down here. We just finally got out of our, our little um, townhouse and finally into a house, and um, that was more for the dog than anyone. <laughs> but but it's, it's good. So, like I said, we just kind of packed and unpacked and came here. So, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, things, things are really good, um, and I love being back here, and, um, you know, I, when I was driving here, I just, I, when we got to Missoula, I was just, like, shaking. I was so excited, um, but it's like, you're like a little kid right now. Like, I know. It's like going to Disneyland. Um, you know, uh, this, this is my home for, for 13 years, and, uh, you know, to, to be back, it's just, it, it just blesses me dearly to see all of you. Um, it's just it's just been great, and so I, I don't want to keep it long. Life is good. We're good and happy, and um, we're happy to see all of you guys and the Seahawks are Super Bowl champions. Um, so <laughs> for all you Bronco fans, I had to throw that out there. Uh, so I've been waiting on that. I was going to wear my jersey, but I didn't. Um, but uh, no, it's it's good, and and it's good to be back here and, and to see things that are that are happening here is awesome, and, and to see all of you is just. It's, it's like coming back to see family, so I'm really excited about it. So, there you go. <laughs> you don't know how much of me wanted to just <clears throat> ask him to do the greeting and stuff as I walked up to the front. <laughs> I would have loved to put Trevor on the spot, but I was a gentleman, and I gave him 18.5 minutes to prep himself. So, um, we're going to go ahead and, and do communion now. So we are talking about the essential, the essential truths of the Christian faith. Essential. We started off a couple weeks ago, and I, I kind of, I told you, I kind of messed up the order. I should have 
switch the first and the second week. Um, we started off a couple weeks ago. We talked about the Bible, God's Word, and how we believe this to be inerrant in its original writings, meaning without mistake in the original writing. Uh, we believe that God inspired it, that everything from Genesis to Revelation, God intended to be in here, which is a challenge to us, just to figure out why. Uh, when we just wrapped up the book of Colossians, you know, we spent several weeks just on his concluding remarks. Give my love to Aunt Sarah. Why would God put that in there? And we talked about why I believe that God included a bunch of those things in Scripture. Uh, there's still some things that I can't figure out why they're in there. Right now, I'm in Deuteronomy. <laughs> And I just start, I started from Genesis, and I'm up to Deuteronomy, and there's a lot of things I go, okay, you know, if I was God, I probably wouldn't have put that in there. If I was God, you would have had the book of Glenn, it would have been about four and a half pages long, <laughs> with illustrations. <laughs> um, but that's, that's why he's God, and I'm not. Okay. So we, we talked about, we, we further went into how you can trust. You know, God uh, tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, he says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. Okay, and there are certain things that he expects us to just accept. Okay, I, there's a good reason for that. It's because we have small brains. And God did not create us with an intellect that could understand him fully. Okay. So there's, there's a good reason why some of the stuff we have to take on faith, because we can't figure it out. Now, some of us figure out less than others. So uh, by measure, we have to have more faith. Because there are certain things in here that I read, and some of you guys go, oh yeah, that means this. And I go, huh? How'd you get that? And, and you're, you just have this thing that, well, and you know, it's God's Spirit living in you that speaks to you the truth of his word. And, and I didn't get that. And I go, oh, well that's one of those ones that I wouldn't have put in there if I was God. <laughs> you know? So we talked about how you can trust this. Well, not only did God, did God require that we take it on faith, but he also gave us certain indications. And we talked about the historicity and the authenticity of his word. And, and, and we, you know, I messed up. I should have taken at least two weeks to cover that subject because there was so much information but I know a lot of people aren't like me. I get really excited about stuff like that. And I get really pumped. And I can spend two or three weeks looking into this and reading it. And then I start talking to my family about it. And after about three and a half minutes, they go, Ten to 12 year old. Off. Off you go. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Anybody else can be excited? Your excuse, kid. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, there are certain things about God's Word that we get excited about. And I love looking into the fact that throughout history, God has proven that He has kept His Word safe. He's kept His Word intact. Okay? Um, last week we talked about what are the essentials of the faith? What are the things we're going to talk about? And, and I gave you a little anagram. There's actually copies of it over there. Doctrine. And that was by Hank Anagraph. Uh, I did that just so you would have something to work from. Okay? And, and it lists the, the essential truths of the faith. These are things we have to agree on. Okay? Uh, now, it's been attributed to St. Augustine, but uh, you've heard the phrase, you know, as the body of Christ, in the essentials we must have... Unity. Unity. We must agree on these things. In the non-essentials, we must have liberty, freedom. Freedom to allow others to um, not eat meat on a particular day of the week. Um, whatever. We've talked about several of those things. In the non-essentials, we have to have liberty, freedom. But in all things, we must have charity, charity love. Okay? We must deal in all things from an attitude of love, not love of self, not love of my own intellect, because I figured it all out, and if you don't agree with me, obviously you're not going to heaven. See, that's, that's where we get into problems. 
because we refuse to accept that somebody can disagree with us on a non-essential because we've made everything essential. Everything. Which is why we have Baptists that don't believe certain denominations are even going to make it to heaven. But that's okay because those denominations don't believe the Baptists are going to be there. And, you know, and, and I, I listen to some of the arguments that denominations have, and not even denominations, within a denomination. Churches within a denomination have, and I just go, really? That's causing you a stumbling block? Now, I can understand, you know, there are certain churches that, that worship different than we do. A lot different. And, and I mean, I think we're fairly middle of the road compared to churches that I've been to. I mean, I've been to churches where it was an organ, and it was a hymn. And that's it. And I've been to churches where they had the full-out rock band. And the dude came up, and you're thinking, oh, he needs the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and a haircut. <laughs> okay? You know, we're, I, I think we tend to be fairly middle of the road. Now, in the IFCA, we're the ones that are kind of like need the haircut. Because most of their churches don't have things like drums and guitars, certainly not electric guitars and, you know, basses and stuff like that. And, and, but those, the, you know, so I can understand why somebody would choose to worship here versus another place. Or conversely, if somebody grew up singing hymns in, in a more traditional setting, I can understand why they want to worship there. Because things of the like tend to gather together, right? Birds of a feather flock together, right? So I, I can understand that. You hang out with the people that you have similarities with, right? Okay? So I understand that. What I don't understand is when people start making accusations that, oh, you can't be saved. Oh, you believe that you're not saved. Or, or you're a lesser Christian. And one of these days we're actually going to talk about judgment. Because that's something that we are warned about, we are cautioned against, and encouraged to. But there's very careful guidelines as to how we're supposed to go about that. So we talked about last week the different things that, that were coming up. Okay? This week we're actually going to get into God. Okay? Now, the reason I started off with the Word, and that's, that's where I wanted to start, that's where we're launching from, is because everything else is dependent on our ability to trust this. Okay? We have to be able to trust that what this says is true. Now, one of the things that you have to agree with on any Christian that you dialogue with about Christianity is you have to have a basis that God's Word is truth. Your understanding can be wrong. My understanding can be wrong. Both of our understanding can be wrong, but God's Word is not wrong. Okay? The failure is with us, not with this. Okay? So we need to have a basis from which to work. Just like any kind of conversation, you know... Um, you guys come up and start talking to me about fishing. I understand the generalities. There's some kind of device upon which is attached some kind of attractant which you hurl out to where the desired target would be in the hopes that they will be attracted to the attractant, allowing you to take them home and eat them. Okay, I understand the principles. I don't understand a whole day of doing that. I don't get it. And I don't understand when you start talking about the differences of, you know, oh, we're in this place, so we got to do this kind of thing. I'm sorry. I go down to the store and say, I want that one. And the guy wraps it up in a package and hands it to me. And I take it home and cook it and eat it. Okay? But, so I can understand the rudimentaries, but I don't understand all the intricate details. So what we're, what we're talking about is the foundation. So we have to trust that we can, we can go from here. So we're talking today about God. And one of the two aspects of God that we have to be in agreement. If you would, uh, open your Bibles. We're going to flip over here to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Okay? And also, one of the things that you're going to find out as we go through this is that all of the doctrines of the faith are found all throughout the Bible. Okay? You can't just say, oh, I'm a New Testament Christian. Do you realize there would be no New Testament without the Old Testament? That, that the New Testament may be the, the walls and the roof, 
But the Old Testament is the foundation upon which it's built. Okay? So, we're going to start in the Old Testament today because the first thing we're going to talk about is monotheism. <laughs> He's using those words again. I'm sorry. Now, i got to use that word because that's the word they gave me. If there was a better word, um, we would go there. Now, monotheism just it means mono, one. Theism, theo, God, one God. Okay, monotheism just means one God. All right, so if you're in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to look in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, you shall, uh, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Um, you know what this is? The Shema. The Shema. Okay. Now, um, the first thing that we need to understand is what a dramatic statement this is right here. He says, Hear, O Israel. Now, you know, this is one of those things that I, I, I'm not as adept with Hebrew as I am with Greek, and I'm not really adept with Greek. I'm just showing you my lack. But one of the things that we need to understand is that in the Hebrew, when they write this, Hear, O Israel, there are two characters that are emphasized. Okay? And what that emphasis means is to bear witness. Now, what's funny is they, they enlarge the first letter of the first word and the last letter of the last word, and those words together spell a word that means witness. Okay? So when they're writing this out, not only are they just writing here of Israel, they're calling the reader to bear witness to what is coming. So it's, it's kind of like reinforcing what's happening here. They're not just saying, um, listen. It's more like, hey, pay attention! <laughs> we are now, huh? <laughs> it, it's a written form of that. Pay attention. What, what's coming up is important. Okay? So they say, hear, O Israel, give me your attention. Now that I've got your attention, I've got to tell you something very important. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. One. We are, okay, I get it. The Lord is one. No, you don't. How many of you got your homework? Anybody bring your homework? Ah, uh, next week. Don't worry about it. Bring the homework next week. Next week, we are really going to be hammering the Trinity. And we're going to be starting... Genesis 1. Okay? And we're going to be working through Scripture. And I'm going to show you how God never intended the idea of a trinity to be a stumbling block. Okay? So, we're actually going to show you next week how trinity is the ultimate in monotheism. Okay? So, he says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, there's an interesting thought here, and I've got to go back here because I, I want to make sure I get this right. Um, okay, now this is, the word for one is echad. Now, this word means unity. Now, what's, what's bizarre about this word is, yeah, we, we translate it, and this is why we say in the original language, it's inerrant. Because, see, there are certain things that the original language carries that we don't get. Remember we talked about love, how, yeah, I love my dog, I love my cereal, and I love my wife. And how the Greek actually breaks that out so we understand the differences in the type of love. We just have love, so we just love everything. Okay? Well, in the Hebrew, this word echad means a unity, a bringing together. And we see this word in, in two different places that kind of give us a little bit of an idea. Um, 
Ezekiel 37, 19, he says, And they shall be one stick in my hand. Now what he's talking about is the, the nation of Israel that was broken, the stick that was broken. And the, the context is God takes those two pieces and brings them together to make one. It's unity. Okay. Now there's a different word that means one all by itself. That it doesn't, you know, it's it's a, a an idea like we would understand one. Nothing else is a part of it. Okay. But a had carries with it the idea of something brought together, made one, a unity, a bonding. Okay. Now uh, we're going to talk about this because this is something that's really important. Because a lot of people get off on this and they start doing weird things like the tritheism that we addressed last week. We talked a little bit about last week. Where, okay, we have God the Father, who is body, soul, and spirit. We have God the Son, who is body, soul, and spirit. And we have God the Holy Spirit, who is body, soul, and spirit. Three completely different beings that's one. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay? And I'm, I actually, I, I have some diagrams next week, some, some things that we're going to put on slides that will help you understand a little better how we can properly appreciate Trinity versus tritheism. Because God is one, one God, in three parts. All right? Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that this week because I, I really want you to get the picture next week. But understand this. When it says in the Shema, God is one, the word is very carefully selected. All right? There's one other case where we see uh, this word used, uh, and that's in Genesis um, 2.24. And in that case, it's talking about a husband and wife. And it says, and they, the husband and wife, will become oh, uh, one flesh. Okay? With what we see, the husband and wife haven't literally become one flesh. I mean, I'm looking around and I see two seats being filled for all the couples. Some of you have one and a half seats filled. That's good. <laughs> but that word of God. Is, is the same idea that, uh, you know, God, remember, um, I've said that, that we oftentimes use marriage as an illustration of God. I disagree. I think God has given us the illustration of marriage, okay? Because God was first. He gave us that illustration to help us understand how he works. So, God is one. So, there's the idea. This is the core of monotheism. All right. Now, what we need to understand historically is this was a revolutionary idea. Okay, This was something that was kind of unheard of at this time. What do you mean one God? Who takes care of the water? God. Well, who takes care of the flowers? God. What about the rain? God. The sun? God. Well, yeah, but which one? No, there's just one. But, but there's all these different things, and, and surely that's too much for one God. Yeah, yours. It's too much for your God because you've got a puny God that's not a God. But our God takes care of everything. Now, this is a, a very unique idea in the history of the world. Since that time, we have a number of religions that have come out with one God, monotheism. The chiefest among them being Islam. Okay? And we will we'll touch a little bit on that maybe next week in the Trinity because that's one of the earmarks that separates Christianity from Islam. Okay? So... We have this, God is one. All right. Now, moving ahead, why is this an essential? Because God said it's essential. As a matter of fact, God thinks it's so essential that he told the people he chose Israel that if you were to take on any other gods, you're to be cut off from the people. Or, you know, I, I, oftentimes I think uh, that's a euphemism when they say they, they must be cut off from the people. Because in a lot of places we see when somebody does something, they must be cut off from the people. But we also see in other places where it says when they do this exact same thing, they better start ducking rocks. They're to be killed. Okay? Now, that's something that we need to pay attention to. If God says it's important, it has to be important to us. Okay? It's got to be important to us. And that's one of the key things that we need to look at 
when we're looking at the essentials of our faith, is does God say this is important? Okay? What is the emphasis that God puts on this? So let's take a look at this. Um, don't, don't turn there. I'm just going to read some, some passages of Scripture. Um, Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. That's pretty cool, right? Before God existed, there were no gods. And after God ceases to exist, there will be no gods. Cool. Do you, do you understand kind of the trick in the words that's being played there? Because I'm, I'm going to read another passage that will make this one stand out a little better. Um, as soon as I find it. Oh, here it is. Right there. Uh, I, uh, Psalm 90, 90, verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, see, we, we go back to this verse when we say, Before me, no God was formed, and after me, there should, well, well, you did, there's, there's reason for that, because God always exists. See, that's one of the attributes of God, is that He's eternal. He has no beginning. Therefore, there couldn't have been anything before Him. He has no end, so there won't be anything after him. Well, now, the, the really smart mouth person would say, well, what about those that came in the middle? Well, he addresses that too. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, we have a lot of faith systems in the world that have other gods. Um, Isaiah 44, 6 says, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. Okay? So we have none before him, none after him, none beside him. But God doesn't just end there. What, what is it then that they're worshiping? What is it that they are worshiping? <coughs> well, he gives us answer to that too. They're worshiping something. They're not worshiping nothing. <clears throat> you, did you know that? You know when the uh, animists are, are worshipping whatever the spirit of the gazelle and the um, you know the, the Greeks were worshipping Zeus and the Romans were worshipping Jupiter and the Hindus are worshipping Shiva and, and all of these different things. You, did you know they're not worshipping nothing? There is something that they are actually giving their worship and adoration to. Did you know that? Do you know what it is that they're giving it to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 17. God is speaking. He says, They sacrifice to demons that were no gods. To God they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. See, this is the danger inherent <coughs> to any thought apart from one God, from monotheism. Now we have a bunch of different things that, that come out. You know, we have monotheism, we have polytheism, we have deism. Uh, there's a bunch of different things. We have pantheism. And we'll, we'll touch on each of those. But ultimately, the only one that preserves you is monotheism. Okay? And the only part of monotheism that preserves you is Shalri. Okay? Jehovah. So, if what they're worshipping is demons, who do you think Shiva is? Who do you think Zeus is? Who do you think Apollo, Jupiter, all of these other gods? Who do you think the god of Mormonism is? How about the god of the Jehovah's Witness? Because God makes it very clear right here. It's demons. Okay? They're fallen. And that's something that you need to be aware of because it makes more sense when we understand what Paul writes. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
Okay? Our struggle isn't with a Jehovah's Witness person. It's with the God that they serve, the principality, the power, the wickedness, the rulers in high places. Okay? That's who our struggle is with. Thank God he's given us the armor that is necessary so we can stand shoulder to shoulder, rank to rank, and watch God trounsel. Right? Boy, you guys are lame. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> okay. Because see, in and of ourselves, we don't have any power to assert any dominance, any authority over a demon. But we also have a passage that says, Greater is he, that's right, that is in me, than he that is in the world. Okay? So greater is the one true God that lives inside of me than any of the demonic forces that are out in the world. Okay? So, um, let's talk about theism real quick. I just want to touch on these because you hear these phrases bandied about. We've talked about monotheism. One God. Okay? One God. Polytheism is just the idea that there are many gods. That's actually where the Mormons are. Did you understand that? The Mormons are in polytheism because they believe that they will graduate to being a god of their own planet. So there's not just one, there's many. It's polytheism. Okay? So we have polytheism, many gods, and that's where most of faith systems are based today. Um, we also have atheism, which means no god, which really is actually a misnomer. It should be self-theism, me-theism. Okay? Because really, if you strip all that away, the only one that has any ability to do or accomplish anything in this life is you. Which means you become your own God. Boy, are you in trouble. Boy, are you in trouble. Because I'd like to see one of them make a flower. Well, that's easy. You just put it in the water, or, you know, put the thing in the soil and cover it up and water it, and it grows. What did you do? Because they do that naturally. They don't need you. You, you can't do it. <clears throat> Boy, are they in trouble. Okay, so we have monotheism, polytheism, atheism. We also have pantheism. Pantheism just means in and out and throughout. Okay? And that's kind of the New Age idea. We see a lot of this in the Eastern religions. Now, I don't mean like Boston. <laughs> I mean a little further east. Okay? We see um, pantheism where God is in everything. Okay? He's here and he just, you're part of him and I'm part of him and that tree is part of him and and the light is part of him. You're a dim bull. Because no, that's not how it works. God isn't in and out and throughout everything combining to make this great plasmatic force that is called God. Now don't get me wrong, that kind of has a, a, an area that there's a bit of truth in it because God is everywhere. There's nowhere you can go to get away from it. Okay? So that part of it is true. But to look at that door and go, oh, yeah, that's God's in that door. I mean, that's a lovely door. I mean, as far as bathroom doors go, that's a lovely door. <laughs> but no. The last one that I, I want to touch on is deism. Oh, wait a minute. There's no prefix. Well, yeah, because deism just the, has the idea there's there's... There's a God or some kind, there's something there, and it, it did stuff to create this, and then it took its hands off and said, you know, it's like playing with the top. You take the top and you go, zing, and then you watch it spin. Oh, look at that. That's deism. God put this thing together and put it into motion and took his hands off and got busy. I kind of relate that to, you know, Baal. Remember when, when, uh, um, well, I just almost said Ezekiel, not Ezekiel. Elijah. Elijah was on the top of the mountain and the <coughs> prophets of Baal are dancing and worshiping and, hey, we need you to come down and burn this egg. And what, what, what did Elijah say? Well, maybe he's busy. <laughs> he might have had to go out and bring, he might <laughs> Yell louder. Because that's what you're supposed to do when people are in the bathroom. <laughs> Yell louder. Okay? That, that's the idea of deism. 
Okay, so really, these are all fancy words to explain people's faith systems. All right, and all of the rest of them really are really irrelevant. And the only reason I tell them to you is so you're equipped. So when people come to you, you can kind of go, okay, look, if it's not monotheism, we're not coming from the same basis. We have no foundation for shared conversation. Okay, and if it's coming from monotheism, we got to really get into the nitty gritty and figure out where you're coming from. Because Islam is monotheism. Did you know that? Ooh, they, they actually refer to us and the Jews as, as people of the book. That, uh, you know, we're, we're not as bad as those that are not people of the book. We're not quite as bad as them. But we're still worthy of being killed. That's so comforting. <laughs> um, I feel so good about that. But, but uh, you know... So just because somebody comes at you with the idea that they are a monotheist, there's one God, doesn't mean we have things in common. What it comes down to is the one God has to be Yahweh. Okay? Has to be. There's, there's no other way we can get around it. Um, I think, uh, Terry, you were telling me about Hugh. Yes. Hugh? Was it Hugh? Hugh? I didn't know that was his name. That's God's name. According to a certain belief system, God's name is Hugh. I like Yahweh better. Okay. Um, so, monotheism. Now, how does this play in our lives? We, we, okay, we have the understanding that God's word is true. God has said in his word that he is the only God. There's none before him. There's none after him. There's none with him. Any of those that are claiming to be gods, that are receiving worship, are not gods. As a matter of fact, they're the antithesis to God. They're demonic. They are our declared enemies. And what is their goal? They want to steal, to kill, and to destroy. All right? They don't care about you. They look at you as an opportunity to hurt God. They look at all mankind as an opportunity to hurt God. Do you understand that? It's not like they think that in eternity they're going to have this little group of people that's going to follow them all through eternity. They understand what's coming. They know what's coming. They want to take as many with them as they possibly can. They want to hurt God. Why? Because God loves people. John 3.16. Let's go back to that. For God so loved <coughs> the world. Okay? We're not talking about this planet, this geographical planet, this physical place. It's talking about those that inhabit it. Okay. that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. Would not perish. Now what is that perish? Death? No. It's the, the death is an eternal death. It's an eternal separation. Okay. But have everlasting life. Okay. So this is God's stated purpose. My desire is that all would be saved. That's my heart's desire. I long for fellowship with <coughs> every created person. Every one of them. Every one of them. That's his desire. That is his heart's desire. Okay? But, but, his enemy, whose job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, is going to do everything that he can to prevent that from happening. So, he comes in two ways. Scripture describes, did you know that Scripture describes the enemy in two ways? <coughs> Satan's like a, what? Roaring lion. Looking for someone whom he may devour. Okay? He is also an angel of light. Masquerading, masquerading as an angel of light. Okay? Now, there are certain aspects that you can see where people are under the authority of the roaring lion. I love this, that, that image because, you know, 
He's a liar. You understand that, right? The enemy's a liar. Jesus calls him the father of lies. And the idea that he's a lion, who's the true lion? Christ. That's right. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The true lion. And that old pussycat with no teeth is going to come face to face with the Creator. All right? So he's lying about the fact that he has any authority to do anything apart from God's will. He's trying to intimidate and scare and, and get people rattled. And it's not going to work for those that are saved, but it's working really well for those that aren't. Because we don't have people going out and saying, What, you afraid of that little pussy cat? Because that's what he is. He's toothless. He can't hurt you. But then he comes around as an angel of light. Okay? I, I find it kind of funny that the greatest separation that the Western world has seen from faith in God was called the age of reason, the age of enlightenment. Don't you find that funny? As in, you know, we realized that we didn't need God because all of a sudden we had the light and the light was our own ability to figure things out. Don't you find that ironic? Doesn't that sound kind of like somebody masquerading as an angel of light? Doesn't that sound funny to you? The greatest period of time that we have in the Western world since Christianity was established, where the church, where the people have fallen away, have pulled away from God. Now I'm talking about church people. Okay? have pulled away from God, we call the age of enlightenment. Isn't that amazing? So, he comes to deceive us by making us think he's something he's not. He's not a lion. He's not an angel of light. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a thief. Okay? So, let's get back to monotheism. One God. I am. Now, we talked uh, a while back, actually almost a year ago, we talked about some of the attributes of God. And I really wanted to share that with you today, but I wasn't going to because there are certain things in there that we take to be attributes of God. But I really want to keep this to the essentials of the faith. We have to believe one God. Eternally existent, complete in himself. Okay? One God. Now, next week, things get really cool. Because we see how this idea, this concept of one God, actually works with the Trinity. No, not three gods. Three parts to one God. And we're going we're gonna to break this down. And we're going to look. And we're going to see this is not a New Testament idea. The idea that, oh, you know, like I said last week, there was 400 years of silence. It's because God was amoebicizing himself and splitting off into three parts. No, that didn't happen. God had planned from the beginning. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in Genesis 1 how God already laid down the groundwork for three parts to one God. Okay? So, monotheism. What is it? Who is it? Yahweh. Yahweh. 